Okay, hi everybody. So if you saw the video from before, great. If not, then you can you really can just start here. It's it's this is you know working with set theory and trying to understand um, what an image does and what an inverse image does and whether or not there's any you know takeaways that w might be you know, mathematically significant for us. And so we are looking at a function that goes from A to B, and we do have a subset of the codomain which. Uh, we are calling L and imagine, you know, that I'm taking this item uh, a sub zero and I'm getting this item B sub zero. I'm just, you know, looking for some arbitrary elements and I'm calling them, you know, A when it's in a, set A and B when it's in set B, but notice that I want B sub, um, B sub zero, B, B naught <laughs> to be in that subset of L. And what we want to do is we want to prove this ugly beast right here is actually a subset of L. And so let's, we'll talk about what this beast is, but before I do, remember that with um, two sets, if they intersect, they look like this. If they don't intersect, they look like this. And if they intersect completely, they look like this. Well, if I'm saying that something is a subset of another one, how much of a sub, I mean, subset is it like is it actually completely contained inside or is it actually the exact same size and so if you've already had an introduction to this you know that we have to prove it from one direction and we have to prove it from the other direction so this is just one part of that proof and when we're looking at this, uh, notice how nothing here is saying anything about onto or one to one. Um, this function we do not know. Question mark is it onto? And uh, we do not know if it is one to one. Uh, they are not necessarily not necessary here. This proof literally is just a chasing down of definitions. And I just want to make sure um, I'm making the videos that I make sure that I understand what these definitions do for us and how we are powerfully able to ready inside of here. Eventually, I am going to say that that inverse. Uh, uh, so the output of the inverse image. Of that set L is actually the same size as L under certain circumstances. Now, right now, I don't know about on two and I don't know about one to one. So the only thing that I can say for certainty is that L um, contains, completely contains uh, our beast right there. Okay. And here's the proof of it. It's already been written. Uh, I thought that would make it easier for the video and a little bit shorter. Uh, plus, if you're in this course, you have this answer. But for me, I I wanted to make sure that I understood what the reasons were for each one of these lines. So we claim that we have an element in this um, output of the inverse image of L. And why do we do that? Because that's where you are always supposed to start when with a proof is you start on the, the thing that's on, on the left here of the of the subset. And so this this existence of B sub naught tells me that for sure there is the, an existence of some A sub naught. And that A sub naught is definitely in that inverse image. And how do I know that for sure? So there's some input in that inverse image set that created the output B sub naught. And B sub naught was in the output of the inverse image of L. And the reason I know that is literally the definition of an image. And I do talk about that at the beginning of the other video uh, right here. The image of that is the set of all outputs that F produces and specifically the inverse image of a subset is the set of all elements of the domain that map to the members of that subset. So if you see some sort of 
element of output is in a codomain subset, you can pause it without any trouble that an input element exists in that inverse image. And that's by the definition of, of, of inverse image and image, okay? So then the next line says, well, since we know that that input exists uh, and we know that it is in that inverse image, um, then we can say that we know that that input creates some kind of output and that output is going to be in L. So there has to be an output in L by the definition of inverse image. That if you know that you um, you have this input and it is in an inverse image set, then you know you have an output in that subset of the code domain that created this inverse image. And we're, we're basically done here. It's, it's, it's amazing how quick this is. It says, since I know that f of a sub naught equals b sub naught, and how do I know that? Is because it was right here. Sorry, I guess I had a missing parentheses. So I know that from up here for some input, that input created that output. And so since I know that that input created that output, and I know that that output is in L, well, now I can just state that B sub naught is an L. And that was really literally where I wanted B sub naught to be. So all I'm doing is I am taking this um, A sub naught, right, this F of A sub naught, and I am substituting it into here. Uh, these two things were equal. Do you see how I had them be equal? And so this is by substitution. And as a final, you know, moment of you know, clarity, I say, since B sub naught was an arbitrary element in my um, output of the inverse image of L, then I can say that the uh, output of the inverse image of L is completely contained, is completely a, a subset of L, and it's true. And um, by the way, if we're taking a final, I think these two lines can be omitted. We could write a QED here and say that, you know, QED here that we did what we were asked to do just in the interest of time. But for the video purposes of the video, I do want to tie it all together that I know for sure that this guy is completely contained in here. Now, notice how I didn't use one-to-one -one and I did not use onto. And the reason why is that um, I knew that I had an output in here. Um, in later classes, you'll be like, well, is, is the set empty? Is the set not empty? Uh, we we want to assume that it's non-empty. And so if it is non-empty, and I do mean L, then that means that B sub naught would be in L. And particularly if I'm trying to say, well, this thing exists, then I want to say that F does actually map something. And I, I know that it maps something because otherwise, why am I even talking about it? So I was able to posit that B sub naught um, is existing and that it, it is an output. And therefore, I have that input and where that input lives. And then I can say that since that input lives there, then that that output lives there. And now we're done. So very quick little proof. Um, there is a second part of this proof, and uh, it's the other version where we don't know that L is on the outside and F of F of F inverse is on the inside. No, here we want to say that L is contained completely in this um, output of the inverse image of that codomain set. And so I've drawn the picture the way I want it to be because I want to believe that it is true. But in this case, notice that we got a keyword right here is onto. It needs to be on to F specifically it needs to be on to. And there's a moment where we're using that and I'm going to explain why. Okay. So we always start with the thing that's on the left. We're claiming there's an element there. It's in L. Uh, we're just doing that because we assume L is not empty because otherwise this is a very boring problem. And so we, we claim that there is an output. It's in L. And because it's an output, uh, it, it well, 
because it's an output, we know that the input exists. And so we could say L is an output of some input. Since F is on to, L is an output of some input. That's what we want to say. And you're like, well, what does on to have to do with that? Well, here you have the, the, the codomain B. And if you, I have a video I'm talking about onto and not onto, um, X squared is not necessarily onto. And I showed you how in that video that we have R, uh, this would be the plus part of R and this would be, you know, the minus part of R. And if you square a number, you're going to get only numbers in here in the plus part. You only get a positive number when you square stuff. So like negative two not mapped to, uh, negative four, not mapped to, uh, negative 100, not mapped to. We can't get there because if you square something, you're always going to get a positive. So what I want to say is, is that if I claim I have this element B sub naught, B sub naught could have been right there. It could have been one of those elements that it was not mapped to, except right here we know that the function is on two so it's not a negative number when i'm squaring you know an x uh, it is a number that for sure has an input so right here this is where we're saying that for sure there is an input that created that so if b sub naught is an output if b sub naught is an output it has an input in A, okay? That is definitely going to be true. Now, do I know for sure that it's in the inverse image? Well, that's where I want to go. So we're going to try and hunt that down right now. So since F of A sub naught equals B sub naught and B sub naught is in L, then that means that A sub naught right here is going to be an element of the inverse of L. So we say it since there, there is an output in L, there is an input from the inverse. All right, now what do you mean? Okay, so listen, L is this subset, right, of the codomain. And I have an input that mapped to this output that is in that subset of the codomain, which means that this input had to lead to that output. And it had to be in the inverse. That's literally the definition of an inverse. So this is by the def definition of an inverse, uh, inverse, I don't know if I'm spelling this right, inverse image. And I talked about that a lot at the beginning of the video. So just go back to that definition and you'll feel really good about this. Now, since B sub naught has an output, uh, sorry, has an input A that is in the inverse, that means that B sub naught, you enact the function upon it it, you know, it, it will definitely be in the inside of here. And the fact that I invoked onto Ness means that L is exactly the same as this. These two things are definitely equal. So here I am finishing up this part of the proof where I say, oh yeah, definitely L is a subset of or equal to the function when enacted upon the inverse image of L. But now that I've done those two parts, um, we can draw this conclusion. When F is on to and L is a subset of B, then L equals F when enacted on F inverse of L.
these two things are exactly equal. And it is an if and only if here. I need this to be true in order for F to be onto and L to be a subset of B. Or if I want F to be onto and L is a subset of B, then I can say that. And I didn't really prove the if and only if part. I just proved that this is true by doing um, element chasing on, you know, the, 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 this version of the subset and that version of the subset. So now I know that those two sets are, are exactly equal to one another. Now you might want to ask yourself, why did we even do this? And I, I want to mention that I did speak with my professor about this today. Um, specifically, the fact that these two guys merge up and they, you know, there's not a, 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 a smaller circle in here that this and this are the same circle might make you begin to wonder something about this circle on the outside because B is actually the range now because the function is on two. The original function was on two means that there's no extra values in here. Let me remind you that if you had like a negative four, it would be outside because you cannot take the square root of, I mean, sorry, you cannot get a negative when you square uh, two. So negative four is not in our, our range of the x squared functions. x squared is not onto. But if I restrict that range to be only things that do get mapped and there's no extra values anywhere, then you might say to yourself, well, then what about this subset L? Is this subset L going to grow out to be the same size as the range? And you might say to yourself, let's not even worry about a subset. Let's not even worry about a subset. What I want to do is I want to worry about that. And so that is actually where it leads to. So what is next? Ready? We need to be able to prove that this is true that if f is on to, that you could say that if you take the function and you apply it to the inverse image of the entire range, you should get the range. And I know that when you're going through stuff, it's like uh, there's a moment of, of clarity, hopefully. That moment of clarity should be that you remember that when you compose a function and its inverse, you just get the input that's basically the same thing. Like uh, people will say that they cancel out. I'm uncomfortable with those words, but um, I was just trained not to say cancel out in my teacher training. But um, yeah, these, these things do technically undo one another completely to every element. So this is for every element E in B. And this will hold true. And we do want to be able to prove that. Um, and then the next one, oh, sorry, on to, uh, yeah. And then, and then the next one is, well, we were talking about this, this guy growing outwards and just becoming one set and not having a subset in it anymore. Well, what about this? Can this grow out and not be a subset anymore, but that A is exactly equal to the inverse image of B? You ask yourself, well, is that true? And it turns out that is also true. And uh, it's trivial as well. There's no proof needed. Pause the video and think about it. Hopefully you did that. And now you see this is literally by definition. Every element in A is created by undoing the function to be. And we don't need to prove it. We can just say by the definition. This one needs to be proved and I'll, I'll leave that to you. And one last thing, um, I did want to mention there is one place up here where you, if you look online, you'll see proofs that mention something, okay, um, about on onto-ness. Um, Right here, I say that there is definitely some output. Um, let's see. There is definitely some output um, 
in this guy and this part is definitely always true literally just by definition but this right here if the function is not in on to so if f not on to there could be another input that um, maps to be some not and that input could um, just be in a and that's because when you have a square a square function you know if i if i take one and i square it i get one and if i take negative one and i square it i also get one and so depending on how I'm defining this subset and saying that inverse image, I could lose this value in that inverse or, you know, the other way around, I could lose this value in the definition of this inverse. And so um, the fact that th there is the existence of one out, uh, input um, is not necessary. I just want to talk about the one that I know for sure is in the inverse because we we wanted to undo a squaring right so something undid that squaring and whether or not it was a negative one that does that or a positive one that does that i, I don't really care but i'm telling you for sure that i know that it is in here um this inverse and another one might be somewhere else and so if you look at versions of this proof that are online you might see somebody mentioning that other one and they they might actually chase it down and then prove that the possibility of another one uh can be resolved to be proved to to be this one that i that i'm finding right now so for simplicity's sake you actually don't have to mention it it's not crucial at least as far as my professor says all right that i think covers everything that I know about the this particular problem.